today is distributed caching for your next Node.js project. Um, dis distributed caching with Hazelcast, of course. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Victor. Thanks, Ben. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you're doing all right this morning. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us today in this webinar where we're going to talk about uh, how to use Hazelcast as a distributed cache for your Node.js application with introduction of uh, Node.js client and some of the examples of the code. So uh, I do have some slides uh, to present and uh, after that uh, we'll switch to, to demo where I will demonstrate some of the code examples, demonstrate some of the application use cases, etc. All right, uh, two words about myself. I work as a senior solutions architect here at Hazelcast, and uh, I solving various problems that um, our customers, our prospects can encounter while designing a solution using Hazelcast or uh, during production time when they already implemented this. So I work uh, a lot, I spend a lot of time working with customers so I know uh, something from the field. Also, I'm a developer advocate here at Hazelcast. So um, I'm talking to developers at the conferences and uh, talking to developers in the communities and the user groups, etc. So if you want me to uh, come to talk to your crowd at your user group, uh, just uh, shoot us um, an email or I will share some contact details after. Um, also, I'm in internet everywhere uh, where you can find GitHub, um, Twitter, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, all things Hazelcast, all things caching is there, um, and awesome pictures of dinosaurs and uh, explosions also there. And you will, uh, if you want to, you know, tweet about this event or tweet about this webinar, you can do it right now at Hazelcast is our Twitter. Um, caching and Node.js as hashtags that you can use. And without further ado, I will continue with some uh, presentation slides. All right. So why why cache? So why we need to use cache and why we're talking about caching here at uh, various point. So usually there should be some problem statement. So there's uh, some horrible boss from the office spaces. Uh, as my problem statement here. And the basic problem is that right now, the complexity of the applications um, increased uh, drastically over years. And uh, many aspects, many architectural aspects of the application. Applications um, right now will involve uh, interaction between multiple layers of, of applications. Um, typical enterprise application might include um, just a few layers which includes database, uh, some of the business logic layer or application server layer, or um, application server can combine this functionality with web server, and plus the web server will represent um, way how we're serving data, plus uh, today many, many clients that consume the data from, uh, from the application server or from web server, not necessarily needs to be a browser, it can be a mobile application, uh, etc. and etc. And uh, so typical typical application, typical uh, business application um, that might consist multiple layer. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a persistent data layer where we store our data or where we retrieve our data if we are in uh, some sort of serverless architecture, we still need to uh, retrieve it from some service. So it can be a relational database, it can be NoSQL database, or it can be even REST service. Uh, you writing application that displays weather, you need to uh, store this um, data in your database, or you can just directly invoke uh, weather service uh, through the REST. Plus there are some services that need to, um, inside your application, uh, it might be different uh, pieces of the code. It might be different um, elements of business logics, and they also need to interact between themselves. However, here uh, we can we can see that there are possible ways how um, that the data transfer might 
slow down. In particular, if you're running database and you don't have optimized, um, you don't have optimized indexes in your database, you might face a situation where data retrieval uh, will slow down, or a REST service for some reason start uh, behave very odd and response time uh, increases. And one of these, I guess, easiest and simplest solution to um, to to provide um, solution for this kind of problems with low latencies, etc., um, is implementation of uh, caching. So caching is a very straightforward solution. Usually, some sort of um, fast retrieval storage where you have. Uh, very simple access pattern. Very typical. It's just a key value, um, key value access pattern, um, and caching is uh, basically is good for few things. It's good for increasing, uh, uh, improving application performance. Uh, like I mentioned in my previous slide, uh, multiple layers. You can you can create uh, different types of caches, not necessarily distributed, uh, not necessarily um, out of the process, but also simple um, simple in process storage like a hash map or just a map or dictionary um, um, or just uh, some some sort of object where you can retrieve data uh, by key will be able to uh, behave as a cache and retrieving data from local cache or from this local data structure will be much faster than retrieving it from um, retrieving it from um, database or REST service. Um, so usually, also uh, to increase application performance, um, caching used, or it can be used to um, to offload very expensive uh, pieces of um, application architecture. So, so let me give you example. For example, you have some uh, some 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 day, some process that needs to, needs to calculate some uh, result for a various user, and even though if um, user input parameters every time will be the same, it still needs to spend time to uh, calculate this. But what if you can cache this result, so in this case you can improve uh, application responsiveness and uh, basically store result as a you know key value uh, pair where the key will be uh, your username and method name and the value would be result of this method name. Um, and uh, instead of, or in a, even even more complex, if you're running something in enterprise environment where you have some batch process that needs to write overnight, and uh, the basically the um, caching can uh, save you not only minutes of users' time but hours and even days. So um, now we're going a little bit further, and we want to increase application performance uh, by growing hardware and uh, the using like an in-process cache um, can also help um, scale scale up. So what I mean by scale, scaling up is when you increase in capacity of uh, your hardware by bringing more hardware without changing anything in topology, without changing any network capabilities. Your system stays in one machine. You just either add in more hardware or migrating your application into a bigger um, node in the cluster. Though the, the cache, and cache can potentially benefit from this. Um, so if you're using in-process cache or um, the caching solution that allows you to um, maybe it would be same uh, a separate process that runs on the same machine. So the caching uh, can benefit from increasing hardware, or you can scale out when you can actually add more machines. And now we go into the uh, um, territory of uh, distributed caching. 
So um, since the, the data will be uh, spread across multiple nodes, um, they will still have some sort of, or application developer will still have some sort of um, shared memory. And uh, so in like in this picture, we have uh, agents meet, they will basically have same, same knowledge so they can operate uh, in a similar manner. So the data will be coherent um, and uh, all application uh, applications will have same view um, same same view to the data. And uh, usually when we're talking about caching, um, it, it needs to be very straightforward. It needs to be very uh, easy to implement and uh, you will see the performance gains almost immediately. So this is basically like five things that I think that the, the major use cases. When we're going to talk a little bit about how Hazelcast can benefit into this picture, I will bring a couple more ideas. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so as you can see, um, like even you start writing your own cache implementation or you can use um, existing out of the, um, it's not in process cache, but uh, out of process cache solutions like Redis or Memcache. Um, maybe many of you already tried this, or did this, but it's not that simple when you are dealing with situation where your data is um, fits in one particular machine. Of course, um, you can you know you can remember this uh, this picture of Green Guy. You can you can actually increase capacity of your cluster by bringing more and more hardware. But still, there is a limit where uh, you simply cannot fit more data into the one machine. Um, in another um, Another use case where application development can benefit from uh, distributed caching is when um, your cache uh, is one of the important components of the system and many uh, applications will reuse same cache data. So your data becomes very important. So it cannot also fit in one machine because of um, you need to have um, backup, uh, you need to have um, redundancy, etc. Okay, uh, can we uh, can we mute our guests? Because I I hear someone is um, speaking on the background. Thanks, man. Uh, I still hear some some voices, but yeah, if you guys you're not talking, mute yourself. And uh, Ben, could you please take care of it? Um, so now I, I, I want to take a moment and, um, uh, and, and talk a little bit about, uh, this data distribution. And, uh, I basically have a, have a quiz for, um, or our, our audience. So what they see on this picture. You probably should see like a Q&A or something like that. Um, you can you can send me this uh, kind of what 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 you can see in in this picture using uh, the chat window. We have chat window Ben, available. No, we don't have chat, but we have Q&A. Oh, that's okay. So in this case, I will just, you know, I will simply explain so what I see. So basically on this, I have two pictures, which represents basically uh, at some point a uh, representation of um, of data, where the data, uh, data is replicated or data is charted or um, also known as uh, the part data is uh, partitioned. So, and... Um, as you can see from uh, from this picture, when with, repl with replication, we have situation when the data is uh, have a copy of the data, e exact identical copy of the data, and on the right side, it's um, basically data that spread across uh, multiple um, multiple um, machines. So, for um, for my fellow developers they might benefit from this picture better because 
uh, usually developers understand uh, uh, the boxes and arrows much better than more uh, less abstract um, uh, pictures or metaphors. So in in this picture that I borrowed from a very great book called uh, Distributed Systems for Fun and Profit, uh, there's example of uh, two types of data distribution patterns. One is a replication um, and another one is partitioning or sharding. Uh, so as you can see here, data uh, in the data set A um, is spread from uh, one node to another. So data by index or we just uh, sort it by, by number because we have an array of entries from 0 to, uh, to 200. And we do have um, entries in a node uh, 1 from 0 to 100 and from node Two from one hundred one uh, in to two hundred. So in this case, um, we have a data set of two hundred entries and spread them across across nodes. It's similar to a data set B, where we have um, where we have ability to um well not ability when we have data set uh, distributed across node one and two from a to n from o to z to another one so from this picture you can take um you can take idea you can take idea that um the replication pattern is basically not extremely scalable pattern to use because uh, usually capacity of the smallest uh, node in the cluster, uh, capacity of the smallest um, smallest machine that you have at your disposal will will dictate will dictate a data size. So in this case, again, you need to grow either hardware if you want to use replication plus. You know, each and every time you need to copy the same data and adding node new new node to a cluster. Will just uh, increase time while the data will be replicated. On the contrary, uh, sharding or partitioning has a, a more um, benefits for a distributed system for scaling out. But in general, in general, uh, uh, these two patterns are in a pure form usually not used in in the real life systems. Usually, um, the developers of the systems. They implement some sort of a variation or combination of both. Uh, one of the variations uh, known as a consistent hashing, where you use uh, the hashing function to uh, distribute key of data. So basically, hash function defines the way where which uh, partition will store or which node will store the data, and based on this hashing function, data will be also retrieved. By but also implementing replication of these partitions of this uh, the small small um, chunks or small storages of data uh, will will be uh, backup or replicated to another another node to to provide a um, fault tolerance and um, that recovery in case of failure now so when we uh, go in through um more um, theoretical part. So let's let's talk a little bit about Hazel, to, about Hazelcast and how it can uh, benefit for your caching solution. So first of all, Hazelcast is in memory data grid. In memory data grid, it's not uh, has three main uh, tasks. One task is in the memory storage, in memory key value storage, and this is why we're gonna focus on this one today. Um, if we will have uh, more interest or like based on your interest guys we can we can expand this uh in memory grid uh, uh capabilities for next webinars about um how you can leverage from node.js but in the today topic we're going to talk about caching so sec second one in memory uh, in, in memory grid piece is distributed computing piece so basically it's not only uh you storing data but you also can execute some sort of um uh, uh, stored procedure so you can store data in the grid and you can process data in the grid in memory <clears throat> what does it mean in memory 
so we not using by default any storage to um, store data in the file system or or database, but it, it's possible. But in the pure form, in the pure form, data stored inside the process of uh, one individual node, or it's stored inside the grid. So when I add more nodes, and I will show you in a uh, couple minutes in my demonstration, um, how data can be stored in, in the cluster. So yeah, it's Apache V2 license. It's a, a full open source system. You can uh, use it in your project without any restrictions. And it provides distributed uh, version of um, caches, which is, we're gonna focus today on IMAP uh, and uh, some other uh, data structures. Um, typical collection, distributed version of set, a distributed version of a list. We're going to talk today about a queue and topic. Um, since the grid, uh, I already spoke about uh, two things about grid. It's in-memory storage and in-memory computing. Um, grid also provides a third thing is the in-memory uh, in distributed messaging. So the system already designed to use as a messaging middleware. On the contrary of um, some other solutions that are available on the market. Some people will reinvent um, their um, like a queue on top of the existing solution like a Memcache or Redis. Uh, so in this case, Hazelcast already provides you with um, the data structures that's suitable for um, organizing uh, the message exchange between your system. So using the grid, uh, it allows you to build um, allows you to build a reactive, uh, reactive application that um, one system can pass messaging to another system via grid. And um, it can be used in uh, queue, so where we have one producer, one consumer, or it can be used topic where multiple consumers can subscribe for these topics and result will be pushed and the data will be available as soon as it will um, change somewhere from one application to another. So it's not request response model, it's more like more reactive uh, event driven uh, process. Okay, uh, now, so the Hazelcast itself uh, is written in, in, in Java, but uh, with a variety of the clients that are available um, and the open client protocol that allows uh, these clients to um, to, to appear basically, Hazelcast can be considered as a fully uh, polyglot platform. So some of the pieces of your application, and I have some customers that uh, already implement this kind of use case where they have traditionally Java backend and this, um, this system uh, integrates with some enterprise level uh, software that's written in Java and they use Hazelcast for caching the data. However, they have um, more like agile and more modern teams who use uh, Node.js for writing front-end applications. And using this uh, Node.js client, they can access the data that the Java system can produce. Or I will show you today how uh, one component of your application can be written in Java and you still can um, integrate and interact with this um, from the Node.js. So I guess it's uh, uh, it's been like 20 minutes. Uh, I went through slides. Now it's time to show you some some of the code. Um, okay. So the basically the couple of things that you guys uh, need to um, in in this example. Obviously, I'm gonna use um, the Hazelcast. I will use Hazelcast open source version because nothing here is related to to enterprise feature. But uh, Node.js client also works with enterprise um, enterprise. Uh, um, Hazelcast as well. So I already have this um, Hazelcast AMG uh, installed. Uh, basically, I just need to download zip and unzip it in one of the directories. So let me show you briefly what you will see uh, when you will um, when you unzip everything. So uh, this is how the the directory stru structure uh, look like. And today I'm gonna use the console application, which is inside a demo folder. This console application um, uh, allows me to start a, uh, the command line tools, a uh, command line tool that allows me to do a simple map, to the simple puts and gets. So it looks like this, and uh, my I will start another cluster. 
um, another node of the cluster. In a second, uh, it will join it. And I will see what do I have here. All right, so I have a two node cluster. Now I can go into the application called Management Center, which is also available in, it's also available in this open source uh, zip folder. Um, you can find this inside the folder called Man Center. So if you can see here, um, and uh, there is a start man, man center sh that allows you to um, to start uh, this management center. So management center, I will use management center to to visualize some of the um, some of the aspects of today's today's presentation. Now, um, so let me switch to um, presentation mode. So let me start with the very simple, um, simple application that will do uh, some of the, some of the things. So first of all, what you need to use is um, you need to get Hazelcast from npm. So it is called Hazelcast client. So if you go and do uh, um, Hazelcast uh, npm install Hazelcast client, um, you will get your Hazelcast libraries inside your. Um, inside your folder, or you can add this in your uh, package JSON. So in this case, um, this is what you actually need. So Hazelcast client is actually very self-sufficient and it doesn't have much of dependencies. One of the dependencies that we have is just a dependency on um, a long, uh, long library and uh, uh, um, uh, what is it? Uh, so we use some dependencies for a long library and Bluebird, we're using it for um, for our promises. The rest of the stuff we use just only for testing. Uh, library itself written in TypeScript, but it compiled and uh, can be used for um, uh, Node.js uh, for, for JavaScript application. So in this in this particular case, also, I use ECMAScript 6 syntax, so it, it's more concise, and uh, I like it uh, much, much better. So the modern uh, Node, um, Node.js uh, runtime supports ECMAScript 6 syntax, and the uh, minimum version of that we test recently of Hazelcast uh, client is um, 4x. So let's say like a, you can, if you have an old version, um, of node, it still will be uh, usable for ROM. It still will be usable for ROM uh, for Node.js, uh, Hazelcast Node.js client. So let me just um, um, just do uh, okay. Let, let, let's let's help here. So the first thing that I will require these two things: client and config. Config allows me to configure how I will connect to the cluster. So in this case. I providing the network address to my cluster, which is local. Um, in uh, can be any any host. Uh, can be you know whenever, wh wherever a network um, it can be used. And after that, from Hazelcast client, I create a new Hazelcast config. And when this uh, client will be used, um, I use uh, we use here uh, promises. And uh, the now we have fully controlled. Uh, fully fully formed a client that will we can use for communicate with our grid. So when I will run this, so basically what it does here, um, I I get a, a map instance from the cluster and I do simple operation put get uh, put a absent replace and uh, remove at the end. So when I run this, I will see something here that uh, I've connected to the cluster and there's a list of members uh, inside the cluster. The cool thing about Hazelcast when, um, remember when I was talking about the scale up, so when you your production application um, experience uh, some high load, you can actually elastically scale it. You just simply add one more node without, um, without restarting your application or without restarting other configuration, etc. So they will be able to discover themselves. So you see in a couple seconds now, this member joined the cluster. And what I can see from, from here, my Node.js application also recognizes that new member was added to the cluster. Now my client also connected to 
all three members of the cluster. So from perspective of management center, how it looks like here, I just put something here, like uh, I'll do something like this um, key, and I'll run the browse. Uh, I guess it's a wrong map. Let me close this. Uh, once again. Of course, the value not found here because I was um, I did I did remove it um, when I call this uh, remove action. So, also very um, interesting point here that since my application already running, I can also react on some events that happened with the grid. So in this case, I have this uh, concept of listener. Um, the listener allows me to register some uh, some uh, some object that has certain uh, methods, in this case, method edit, method removed, that will listen this event and everything that happened uh, with this uh, with this particular map will be reflected um, on the listener code. So if I, from my Java, from my Java, the console application that I use to demonstrate this, uh, I do an S that allows me to switch uh, to, to my map. And I can do m dot values, um, some value in this map. So what I can do here, m dot put, um, I can do webinar uh, and no GS. So I paste this uh, from from Java client. When I switch to my Node.js client, I see my listener detected that something happened on the server side, and the server pushed this data to the my Node.js client. Now, as you can see, edit uh, key webinar. Uh, old value was not there, because, so in this case it's undefined, and new value is Node.js. If I also go to Management Center, I will be able to read this um, uh, from here. Um, and uh, Node.js is a value, etc. So you will see it here. So using um, uh, Hazelcast and Node.js, you can write uh, um, a reactive application when you, or like a event-driven uh, application when one system can um, generate some sort of event and another system will uh, react on it. So it's pretty cool. All right, so going next. So uh, after map, I think uh, we need to talk about another data structure, which is also very, uh, very powerful and very useful. Sometimes, so map is a typical uh, typical uh, data structure where you have a key value. You need to you need to know the key and you need to know value. But sometimes you also need to write uh, something uh, which has a same key, but you need to have a collection of objects. So in this case, multi map is very handy. So you can, um, as you can see here, with multi map, I just need to retrieve this instance from from client, I do get multi-map. If multi-map was, uh, was not there before, it will be created, so you don't need to check it uh, by yourself. You need to do uh, create a multi-map explicitly. So it will create a multi-map called restaurants. After that, I will use key New York to put a couple restaurants in New York. Uh, not the very, maybe <laughs> very famous in general, but nothing to do with New York. It's just a Red Lobster uh, restaurant will be there. And after that, um, uh, I will put another one called Italy, uh, which is uh, Italian marketplace style restaurant here in New York. Um, and now by inside New York, I will be storing uh, two entries, Red Lobster and Italy. And the same thing for um, for Las Vegas. So I'm putting here burger, I'm putting here alibi, and I'm put, putting here a uh, pub and grill. And after that, I'm reading this result by key Las Vegas. And so what? let's see what's... Um, what 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 we gonna uh, get uh, when we run this example? So also when we connect it now, the client also connects to the cluster, get information about all members of the cluster, um, and I do have it here. And this is my result. In my management center, I also can check the multi map. There is a multi map called restaurants, and I see uh, one of the node that hold uh, the entries. In another one uh, hold two entries, and another one hold three entries. Another very cool part of um, of Hazelcast, um, say you want to um, you're running Hazelcast in cloud, you're running your your caching application in the cloud, 
and you want to elastically scale up, I already show you how we can elastically scale up and without application restart, but you don't want to uh, pay extra um, money if you don't need to uh, use uh, the system. So in this case, you can also um, decrease size of the cluster without actually losing your data. So as you can see here, uh, my, uh, my, my map right now contains two entries um, and one of the entries has a backup on another node. So I can, I can easily, without any problems, can go there and shut down node. And I will go ahead and shut down this member. So um, the management center will uh, display this information um, and uh, we still have our data. Data is there. So if I'll do map browser, I'll try to get the webinar. Um, it's still there. And what was the first one? Uh, first one was some key. Okay, so we do some key, we should get some value. Yeah, so data is still there, even though I, I, I decrease number of entries, um, a number of nodes and the same same stuff with multi-map. So Hazelcast provides um, capabilities of um, automatic data migration and automatic backing up uh, of, of, of the data that you store there. I, I can actually, I can even kill one more. So I'll go here and I will do shutdown node and I'll do shutdown member. Now my map still has my data. So even though I killed three nodes already and uh, I still have a data, but unfortunately I don't have uh, any backups, but uh, the backups were stored in another node but um, I decreased my, decreased my cluster size from three nodes to uh, one node and uh, I, didn't lose, I didn't lose any data yet. So if I'll go here and I'll check the uh, webinar. Okay, it's still there. Now, just um, if we're running the clustered application, I still want to have it um, in multi-cluster mode, which would be cool. Uh, just, a, just a cool to see like cluster of like three nodes than cluster of one node because there's not such thing as a cluster with one node. All right. And as you can see from perspective of application, uh, my application didn't throw me any errors. So we just have some warning that connection was closed because two nodes were removed from the cluster, but client was able to um, default fa fail over to another member. And after a certain time, um, when the member uh, went up, client was able to reconnect. Same same story here. So I'm still running. So these applications are running uh, and uh, I'm just killing uh, nodes randomly. All right. Couple other things, very interesting, uh, interesting things that you can you do with Hazelcast um, using Q. So Q is a data structure that allow you to uh, place something in the Q and you can read it some in other side. So in this case, I use this um, Q .offer that will paste uh, or put the entry of a named item inside the Q. And after that, I will use method pool that will uh, read data from the queue. And I will print the result. Um, also, I can pull for some duration of time. So I can do, I will go ahead and run it. So I was, I placed it here, item. After that, there was another item and yet another item. Though, because, um, because in, in um, uh, no, no GS application, everything is asynchronous. You um, you need to somehow explicitly order this call. So in this particular case, um, if I would need to have an order of these uh, items in my console, I need to do uh, like a then after a then after then. But in uh, queue itself, 
they stored these entries are stored in order how they were uh, pushed here. So offer another item, yet another item. So they will be there in this queue by this order. Now, so the queue allows you to write applications where you need to do um, one producer, one consumer type of uh, scenario. But when you need to have one producer and multiple consumers, you can use uh, the, the data structure called uh, topic. So topic allows to multiple consumers uh, to um, to consume. So I started this process. Now it's still uh, sitting here and uh, are waiting. So if I will start another run topic, uh, single instance. Okay. So I will go here and say run configuration. So um, in this case, I need to make sure that I will start another instance, not the same instance. So if I'll go here and run this topic once again, so it will also register listener and also publish entry to the to this um, to this topic. But we have a previous version, previous uh, instance of this application that already has registered instance. So this guy just published um, uh, published the um, entry um, and another guy just simply uh, he was sitting there and uh, he was listening to this if I will start another one, so you will see this guy started, pushed this entry into the um, into the topic, successfully received this message in the topic. This guy also sitting here waiting for this message, received this message, and also the, the third one also received this um, from um, from the topic. So um, we talk a little bit about. Uh, some other data structures that we have we have a list. So basically, allows you to have um, the entries in order. So in this particular case, I'm putting some elements, and there are some very convenient uh, method like a contains that check if element is there, uh, or I can also add these entries in a batch mode. Like I can put multiple entries here. So let me run this list. Um, so I, I was um, I placed this element here and checked if uh, my list contains this. Um, same thing with another one. I placed two elements, and after that, I run the uh, if the the my collection my list contains everything. Now uh, sometimes you don't want to have um, uh, duplicates in your data structure, so this why sent uh, might be very handy. So in this case. I have a uh, multiple elements. A set has a similar semantic as uh, as a list, but uh, set the won't allow you to have duplicates. So as you can see, I have a uh, three duplicates. So it will first uh, will write the first one, and it will ignore second one and third one. So I will just run this. As you can see here, still no duplicates. Just one one entry here. So set is very handy if you need to store some of the collection without uh, without any duplicates. So and uh, I guess the last one, just I want to uh, show you something is that um, you can also using Hazelcast from Node.js you can also organize um, distributed uh, concurrent access to some resources. For example, you are working on um, some some like web crawler um, that will uh, the process some of the the, the pages in internet, and you want to make sure that your node, your not node yes, but your application node, will be responsible for processing exactly once. Uh, so only one node can can access to this uh, some resource at a time. So in this case, you can create a distributed log, uh, do something, and after that you can unlock it. So in this case, 
when another process will try to do the same, it will not be able to do this. It will uh, his request will be put on hold. So it's very convenient. All right. And uh, now let's put everything together. Now put everything together. I showed you multiple uh, data structures that can be used um, in Hazelcast, but uh, in uh, in this particular demonstration, in this particular uh, webinar, I want you to show a couple um, how we can use it in the real world application. So I have this um, Express application that will... Um, so basically, this uh, this application will uh, invoke some REST service. So in this case, it will invoke a GitHub a API and uh, will query organization by number of uh, repositories. And the first time it will uh, read this from uh, from from actual URL. And the second time it will read it from the cache. And all this uh, stuff. Um, I'll show you how we can benefit uh, from using cache. So I'll start this application. So now my application uh, is an express application running all on port 300. Um, and I will use this um, the, the utility called Postman that allows me to, um, to send the request. So in this case, I'm using localhost 300 and there is a, um, a rest endpoint repo so where I can pass the parameter org, which is Hazelcast. So now what happens, um, it executed this code and this code went to uh, to internet, I get this JSON file and the time, it took me like 800 uh, milliseconds. So it's still okay, right? It's less than a second, but it can, we, can we do better? Um, so the second time when I will call this, second time it will check if um, I have it uh, in... Uh, in my cache. So I will do it once again, and the response time it was eight times faster, right? So because everything right now cached in in the cache, uh, and I will go here and I see this uh, GitHub repos, uh, GitHub orgs a map which has one element. So if I will go here and do something like Hazelcast. And I will have this JSON representation of uh, all these repositories that's available in Hazelcast. See, so it's a roughly entry size is roughly 300 kilobytes, and you retrieve we retrieve this in uh, very quickly. Now, so if I will run this next time, it will be even faster. And the reason of that is is a thing called near cache. So Hazelcast, uh, Node.js client support a uh, data structure called uh, NearCast. It's not like a data structure, it's just a configuration parameter that allows um, data that was retrieved once. Um, so basically, we don't need to hit the cache, like the remote cache each and every time. We can store it in local in-process cache, so we can don't need to go over network for that purpose, and I can do, um, <coughs> now data is retrieved from my local cache, and as you can see, the timing is here, uh, 26 milliseconds, so it's, it's quite impressive, I guess. Uh, we improved application performance from 800 milliseconds to 26 milliseconds, so uh, we can try something else. Uh, let's try it. Oracle. Um, did you know that Oracle has uh, 63 public repositories? So we will do it, um, now we retrieve it from a local cache and you know, the total retrieval time is um, incredibly low. <clears throat> so um, I will post um, all this code, uh, obviously in the GitHub repository. Uh, there's a GitHub, I will post it in, uh, we, will, we will send you links, but basically this is a repository called uh, Hazelcast Node.js RevCard. You can find here uh, all the code that I demonstrate to you today. All right, so I'll go with some um, 
some useful materials. So basically, um, you can learn some of the features of um, Node.js client if you go to hazelcast.org uh, and there's a page about uh, Node.js client. It has all materials, uh, GitHub links, um, a link to previous releases, um, and there's some features that are available here. So um, some of the features that is not there, um, they will be added in, in the future. But uh, yeah, so far, so good. Also, we have this uh, very useful resource called uh, RefGuard. Um, so this is kind of a um, uh, handout that you can have as your um, ref card. So basically, you can have it in your desk when you are programming some of the uh, with uh, Hazelcast. Basically, it's a resource card which has all the samples in one place. You can just copy paste it or you can just read it and, uh, you know, replicate this in your code. And obviously, um, Hazelcast uh, Node.js client is published on uh, Node.js. Um, uh, I want to make sure, uh, yeah, I want to point out this is 100% uh, pure uh, Node.js implementation. It doesn't have any dependencies on Java or some other nonsense. It is 100% Node.js uh, JavaScript uh, library written in TypeScript, which is also cool if you're interested in learning how how to build your Node.js, how you build your Node.js modules using TypeScript, which we think is uh, very handy for um, for developers. Uh, TypeScript is an awesome language that provides uh, um, type information, but also produces very uh, uh, human readable uh, J JavaScript code. So, like all the source, um, it's on GitHub, and uh, um, you can find everything that you want to have here. So, configuration, um, it's a uh, TypeScript. All right, so um, this is GitHub link at the top, Hazelcast, uh, Node.js client. Uh, we do have, uh, so if we go here, I'll, I, I should have a link on the top, yes. So this website contains um, the API docs. Uh, you can uh, you can read some examples, how you can install, how you can test it locally, uh, and most importantly, how we can answer some questions, because we do have, um, um, we do have Stack Overflow, uh, you can ask questions in, in Stack Overflow. Um, also, it's it's well documented, like all the API calls are well documented here. Um, so for example, like if we go into to config and we need to know something about client config and uh, the, all these methods that we have in the client config are uh, documented here with links to, um, to actual source code. So it is it is pretty cool, um, and we want you to give it a spin. We want you to try it out and let us know how it works. So you can always reach out to me in Twitter. Uh, it's uh, the the first one. This is my Twitter. Uh, all for those of you who don't have a Twitter, uh, you can always send me email at the victor at hazelcast.com. And uh, this is pretty much it. Uh, we're always looking for your feedback. Uh, let us know. Uh, what kind of topics uh, you're interested in, and we will be able to um, to to come up with some materials to talk to you about this. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. And now I will have some questions uh, if I have any. Ben, is uh, now it's your turn. Sure. So I we already have some questions coming in, but uh, anybody who has questions. Please use the Q&A box on the WebEx toolbar. If you're in full screen mode and you hover over the bar at the top, you can get to it that way. If you're not in full screen mode, you'll see it in the upper right-hand corner. Just click the Q&A box and type your questions in there, and uh, we will get to those. And, and uh, Victor, you can navigate. You can see the questions that we already have. Uh, OK, Let's, let me do this. Okay, so I have a question about, okay, let me scroll up. So can you uh, can you share Hazelcast ready to play setup, deploy Hazelcast cluster on top of Docker Swarm? 
Um, not at this moment. We, I don't have example out of the box with Swarm, but I do have a, a PR cooking for um, um, using Hazelcast with Docker Compose. Um, where is my Hazelcast code samples? Um, I guess the Swarm in Kubernetes is going to be the uh, next thing to do. Yeah, this is my uh, pull request is almost approved here. How to how to ready to play how to play with um, um, Hazelcast uh, with uh, Docker Compose, but basically Hazelcast is in um, in uh, Docker Hub. So all our you can basically go here and you can find this link how we can bring this uh, with Docker. Uh, it is on download page uh, and you can use it there. Uh, how do you dynamically add without tampering with XML and restarting? Uh, so yeah, the, the, you don't need to change the configuration if you want to dynamically add uh, nodes to the cluster. This is what I demonstrated today. So the I didn't change any line of configuration file. Um, the Hazelcast will discover based on um, one of the live nodes. If you have one live node, other members will discover this node and will join it. Apart from that, we also do have um, we do have a discovery SPI that allows us to run uh, uh, virtually everywhere. So uh, we can you know we can use um, any cloud native uh, discovery mechanism, or we can use some open source tools like Eureka to do service discovery and the console to discover uh, a node can join there and uh, retrieve the data from uh, Eureka console its CD and from Heroku, Kubernetes, etc., etc. Okay, so how to start the console. So uh, once again, uh, it's, it's, it's very simple. When you download Hazelcast, when you download Hazelcast um, a zip file, uh, you have something like this. This is your directory structure. And uh, with this directory structure, um, you will find this um, folder called demo. And inside demo, you have this um, console sh if you're running Unix or Linux, or console.bat um, if you're running in um, in Windows. So basically, if you do something like this, for example, console sh uh, or console bat, it uh, looks like this. It's basically just a one Java process, um, Java minus jar, and this is Hazelcast jar. This is console app. Uh, uh, can we use Hazelcast as a session management tool for Node.js applications? Uh, yes, you can, but I think this would be very good, a very good topic for a next webinar. Uh, so I don't, I don't have, um, I don't have it uh, example uh, out of the box. But the short answer is yes, you can. Uh, the question is: Management Center Enterprise Edition feature or it's available is Community Edition too in some form? Yes, um, the Management Center available in Community Edition and it's good to running with uh, two nodes on Hazelcast cluster. Uh, Management Center itself, it's not Enterprise Edition. Uh, you, if you just need Management Center, uh, we can give you a license for Management Center. Uh, obviously, not for free, but uh, you can use it for free with uh, Hazelcast. Uh, uh, up to two nodes uh, Hazelcast cluster. Is it possible to implement entry processor in Node.js uh, Node or JS? Uh, yes, it's possible to implement uh, entry processor. So entry processor, it is a, a node. Uh, um, entry processor, it is a kind of uh, ability to execute code in the grid, um, and entry processor will be uh, responsible for. Um, modifying some entry inside the grid so you don't need to retrieve the uh, data, change it uh, locally, and after that, push it back, entry processor. Um, where we can find this example, how you can do this. Um, so um, if you if you have the source code of Node.js client, there's a code samples, how you can do this stuff, many stuff that I explained today. Uh, and also, um, uh, where's the two, 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 two. we do have um, every, every every aspect of Node.js library is covered by by test. You can find this um, entry processor. Um, yeah, this is an entry processor that will execute on all on entries. 
uh, from from JavaScript. Is there any restrictions uh, for different types of clients, Java, Python, JS, working with the same instances of map topics that they see? No, there's no restrictions. Uh, they they fully uh, compatible. Uh, only thing that you need to have in mind is that the serialization format needs to be the same. Um, in um, in uh, you you cannot read Java objects from Python code uh, and etc. So things like this uh, things you need to check is you need to either use some of the serialization formats that we provide out of the box in DeFi data serializable portable and some. Or you can use custom serializer, but in this case, you need to make sure that your custom serialization library supports all these languages. But from perspective of uh, restrictions, no, there's no restrictions. You just want to see on the uh, client compatibility metrics, uh, sorry, over here, which, uh, which language supports which feature. Uh, if you don't see the feature that you need, you can also open feature request in GitHub. How does uh, data cache eviction works of near cache feature enable? It's a good question. So um, when uh, uh, near cache, first of all, has its own eviction configuration, you can have different configuration uh, of uh, eviction on the client, and uh, you can have different configuration of eviction on the server. Um, and uh, if you change something, the way how it works near cache is uh, the way uh, when you change something on the server, um, the server will send notification event. So in this case, entry will be evicted from your near cache. So next time when you retrieve the data, this data will be um, uh, this data will be retrieved from uh, um, from the server. So um, the, the everything is is described in Hazelcast documentation. Um, we can follow up on this one as well. So. Uh, how do you add map listener or on Hazelcast cluster? Um, so there is API uh, called, um, I'm sorry, I'll just switch to, so you can add a listener from the client um, using map add listener, add entry listener, or you can do similarly uh, from the Java code. In the Java code, there's also map add entry listener method and you can add it uh, on the server side. Uh, in this case, your in this case your methods or your your code of your listener needs to present in the class path of a cluster. Okay, so I hope I answer uh, all questions. Right? No? Yeah, I did. Uh, if you have some questions, guys, don't hesitate to reach out to me um, on Twitter. Um, also, we do have a okay, good, 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 um, good thing to point this. So we do have. Uh, if you go to our uh, GitHub, uh, you will be able to find our Gitter. If you have some questions about uh, Node.js, you can join our Gitter chat. Um, and ask questions there, or as usual, um, contact me in this uh, in this uh, means of communication. I guess um, I would say thank you for your time. Thanks for coming, and um, I hope it was useful for some of you. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ben, for facilitating this. And microphone to you. Great. Thanks, Victor.